Welcome back, sports fans. Another episode of Moving Needle Podcast. I've got quite an experienced podcaster, but he's even more experienced now on the racetrack. Although, he's got a lot less experience than the other guys that he's whipping their ass. Uh, multiple national <laughs> DH champion. Feels like he came out of nowhere because he got a little late start to the World Cup scene, but multiple World Cup podiums. Almost won that elusive win Last year, if you've been living under a rock, you don't know who he is. And if you haven't, it's Dakota Norton. Uh, dude, thanks for making the time and welcome. Yeah, I'm happy to be on. I, uh, yeah, it seems like it came out of nowhere, but I think you were the one whooping up when I was uh, first coming up. I remember my first pro race, I was watching you lay it down in slalom. So, uh, yeah, man, a little, little bit to get rolling here, but we're, you know, we're at it now. So it's cool to finally get to chat with you and jump on and, uh, yeah, man, you were you were you were absolutely slaying it when I first came on the scene. So it's good to get to chat with you. Yeah, you're too kind, but you won that first pro slalom. I think it was at Whistler or whatever. If I was reading up, so then you would have smoked yeah. me though, because that was in 2015. No, I, I was... I, you, no, you smoked me at Sea Otter. First run, first pro race, first pro slalom. You were riding for uh, poly, UR Polygon and just smoking dudes in slalom at Sea Otter. So Dude, I don't you know shouldn't what. Have... You shouldn't admit to that. Do you know how bad that bike was? Did you see? Do you even rem- I'll find a picture of this farm gate. Me and my brother I, called it a farm gate, and I don't even know how that happened, man. So thank you. All you listeners heard it here. I smoked Dakota at one of my last races. I'll just, that's why I retired. Yeah, I jumped off. But um, yeah, mate, uh, it's, yeah, it's good to jump on. Because I, I, you know, looked up, like you were like, you know, at, at uh, it was, towards the end of your career for sure but an absolute legend when i was first coming up so yeah i was definitely looking up to you and i yeah that was a that was that was uh the sea otter is the one that's always got away <laughs> but uh yeah first 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 kind of go there and uh you were you were at the end and yeah kind of made my name as a slalom guy there for a while but uh downhill guy now yeah, I was going to say, you definitely cemented yourself as a downhill guy. No, I remember that because you've got like the BMX background and the motocross. And um, you always definitely, you could hear Dakota Norton was at the races, like in the last few years. I could always hear you at the races, but we didn't connect for a while, you know, because we were just yeah. in different circles. So I've always had this mutual respect for you, but from a distance. And then I kind of, I think we chatted a bit over a Crankworks race or two. And I was like, okay, I get the boisterousness. Like I get that he's just sin- yeah. sincerely having a great time out there. It's not like you're not putting on a show. You do sincerely no. like love riding your bike and, and being at races. Well, I mean, imagine this. So you, I'm a kid that's moving boxes and riding my local skate park after work at five o'clock. Moving company was directly next to the skate park I rode at. And my buddy's like, hey, man, check out this downhill thing. You should try this sometime. You're good at riding BMX. You're good at riding motocross. Like, you might be kind of good at this. And shows me Danny Hart's uh, World Champs run. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I drove home, like an hour home. And uh, two years, like flip the swip, two years later, I'm racing all of the fastest dudes in the world. Like something that I never dreamed I would have ever had the opportunity to do. Like far exceeded, like in where I am now has far exceeded my expectations. But if you look, you take this kid from this small town and then you put him in this environment of all these dudes he's looked up against riding my bike on a bike I never thought I could afford on a track that I never dreamed I would have been able to go to. I was like out of my mind. Oh, it was like, like it's like a kid in a candy store. So it was definitely, yeah, for sure. I was very excited those first few years. And now I'm like almost the opposite. I'm like the grumpy old guy, <laughs> but <laughs> It's uh, you'll, yeah. It's you'll get good. there. You'll get there. You'll get to become grumpy like me. But I remember my first trip <laughs> over to America, and I'm qualifying at a Norber, and Kurt Vores is behind me, and who knows who was in front of me, and I was just, dude, I couldn't handle it. It was just like these are the guys I saw back then. I was seeing them in magazines and maybe like a yearly VHS video. You know, it wasn't like now where yeah. I feel like the kids probably aren't as intimidated because they just feel they know everyone through podcasts and social media a bit. Yeah. If you're looking at these dudes you've looked at in magazines and you got one of them that's uh, dropping into qualifying behind you, it (laughs) changes your perspective real quick. But uh, I think now, yeah, we almost get numb to things. Like I was uh, racing down in Central America uh, last week and that that was definitely an eye-opening experience because everybody wants to grab a photo with you. You can't walk five feet without taking five photos. So it was 
pretty wild, but in the U S and we have like, you know, social media and I, yeah, I think that because of the vlogs and the videos, people feel like they know you before they ever meet you or know who you are, who you're perceived to be. And it kind of makes it so people aren't as uh, scared, you know, it's kind of numbs it a little bit, but that's where, you know, we get instant, we get instantly see, or we get to see everything instantly where back in the day you had to wait for the video part to drop. It was just a different thing. Yeah, that is super interesting. Hey, like I, I just was so in awe of these guys and I, and I see it now, like they don't even know who some of these old guys are. And I'm like, do you even know what this guy did in the sport? But they're just onto the next big thing or the next guy on social media, the youngsters, you know, because it's, they don't have to go back in the archives is what I mean, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, I still, I think, I think the tables will turn and those long formats will come back. And I mean, if you're not watching, like, and even for me, like I was fully racing world cups before I had ever watched new world disorder, like any of the old, like mountain bike, you know, media videos or like three minute gaps or anything. It was just like so eye opening to like go back and watch it all once I was like in it at the time. And, you know, like all these dudes that were, were for sure legends. And like, you know, I've gotten to be like really good friends with Nick Hanna and then going back to watch him race for so many years and like the backstory of his career. Like to me, that's really cool. And that's way cooler than any eight second Instagram clip. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and, and I hope it does come back. I mean, I know Brendan's announced he's doing another death grip, so that's one of the last few sort of long format, which will be cool to see like a longer section, and then if you feel like watching more than three minutes, you might have a 50-minute film. And, dude, that's all I did in the off-season was just burn through VHS tapes, and you probably haven't even heard of the circus. Like, that's what I grew up on. It was like the early <laughs> 2000s. And there's some yeah. good music in there that – Maybe, maybe I'm showing my age, but um, the sport surely has has progressed. That's for damn sure. So you were down, and where were you saying? Were you in Colombia? Where were you saying? Uh, I was in Guatemala. Oh, Guatemala, yeah, Central even, America. Yep. Yeah, even more yeah. unique. Guatemala yeah, racing was, there. Yeah, it was sweet, dude. They put on a heck of a race down there. It was. Uh, it's just a whole different deal. I mean, we you know you grew up racing you know norbas and that was far like before my time um the u.s scene had had definitely let's not call it died but um slowed down quite a bit uh, it, it kind of died it kind of died yeah. pretty hard i think it died i think, it I died. think you're being but, very nice you're you're from the u.s <laughs> so you can't say i'm telling you it Careful. died a horrible death but it's back <laughs> yeah it's we're we're getting there we're crawling crawling our way back but um dude, they put on an awesome race down there, you know, and it was, uh, it wasn't, there wasn't, weren't a ton of riders, um, in the pro class, but it's just for them, the track was very extreme, but for me, it was like a legit racetrack. And, and honestly, it was more difficult than ra to race than a lot of the American races I've raced in past years, just because it's, it seems like the tracks are just so easy over here. And because of the, the dust and loose rocks and, um, it was like, pretty gnarly and it uh, got pretty rough so yeah it made for a really challenging race where you're sitting in the starting gate going like am i gonna make it down is anything unexpected gonna happen you know where in america it just seems like you're wide open on the limit and uh everything is pretty expected for the most part and you just have to execute so it's great, great training yeah that's awesome because some of the world cups um have moved on from where you were quite nervous about a few sections of getting it clean it wasn't nerves of like I have to not break here. I have to get this run perfect. Otherwise, you know, I'm so off the back. We had sections, I guess, that were more technical. And and like you say, if it's maybe not a hard course, but to put speed onto it with the dust and the ever-changing conditions. I have that a little bit back home here if we build a fresh track and it's so dry. Yeah, you know, to get consistent runs is your challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, putting the run, you know, in the same – two seconds depending on how you hit things and maybe like leo gang in the wet if trying to execute that first off camber or get through the roots and execute the corner on the motorway because if you don't the race runs over and i just feel like we've kind of gotten away from that and it's just like how fast can i or how close can i get to the limit without having a big explosion and it's not like if i don't hit this one route i'm gonna lose three seconds if i don't hit the route correctly 
So it was definitely that kind of a race run down there. I mean, in qualifying, I was like going in a straight line down a dusty straightaway, as you you know, a foot of dust. And all of a sudden, the bike just went left, and I almost went off the track, and I was just going down a straightaway. So <laughs> it's not often we we get those kind of conditions where you're just reacting. Uh, and so it was, dude, it was really good. It was a really good environment. And uh, yeah, it's good to go somewhere new. It's like when I was, we talk about me being so excited when I first came on the scene um because i was going to these places that i never thought i would go and everything was new and every like it didn't matter that you guys had been to fort william 20 times or whatever i it was my first time there and i was pumped so it seems like it's not often that i get to go to a new culture and ride a new track in a new environment very often so it was really cool to get the opportunity to do that and probably seeing everyone so stoked that you'd made the effort to get there. Obviously, you're on a new team, so that's quite exciting for them to see. That press make it quite special as well. You know, you're actually giving back to the sport without you knowing. Like, there could be a kid there that saw you down there, and he decides that's what he wants to do for a living. Yeah, for sure. That's And that's why I've, like, shared so much of my story over the years, because – like, I think people have definitely, like, maybe took it out of context, but the reality is, like, I'm just a dude that rode skate parks from, like, a struggling city in a place where there's no mountains for, you know, seven hours, eight hours. So where, where I live now is the closest place with, that I had to ride before, and it's like I shared a ton of my story to try to make – just make kids believe that the – like, they can – like, you actually can do things that you don't think – are capable if you really work really hard and apply yourself. And that's like kind of the same thing applies to being down there last week. It's like, you know, like we, there's, there's some, some riders down there like Camilo and Valentina that have went like, you know, they're from Latin American countries and Rafa Gutierrez and, and they've accomplished amazing things on the world cup circuit. But you know, there's just a couple guys that have made been fortunate enough to like go overseas and race and, I mean, I think you definitely have to be like when we talk about Central America, like it can be like very poor um, or there's people that are pretty well off. And, and the, the it's very broad um, what people can afford and do down there. I mean, there's it's it's definitely like un, like a lot of it is undeveloped uh, as as like, you know, a country goes. So but it's cool to be able to like go down there, race my bike and like they people get to see riders that they would never see that's that's not the internet and maybe give them like some hope to like push and try to like change um their their path if if you work hard at something and you're you get good at it like you don't really need like all the shiny fancy stuff to be really good at something i mean obviously mountain biking is expensive like there's no doubt about that but you don't have to be the 14 year old kid with the $10,000 bicycle to be good. You know, I mean, if, if you can find a way someone will, like for me, I could have never afforded to even buy a $2,000 downhill bike. Like if I didn't have someone help me, like if my mechanic James didn't help me with a bike, I never would have raced downhill. Like, but I was good. So that opened those opportunities. Yeah, that's so well said. Uh, I mean, there's some similarities from South Africa. Like our money it doesn't go very far. I mean, right now it could be $1 is 20 rand. So for someone to get overseas, like I was just really fortunate my late dad invested in getting over, but it probably was because he took a little cheeky bit out of the mortgage of the house to take, to do yeah. so that, to do these European things. And I bring that up because I love the story. I love it's rags to riches. It's like, you don't have to have the latest things. It's like those, those blue collar motocross families, you know, Half those guys, I say half, nearly all those guys that win championships, <laughs> I say half, Dude, like literally, is it not all of them? The Dungies, Carmichael, Stewart's, like all those ones come from like, it's, it's called blue collar over there. Like they're working, yeah. the parents are working like two jobs, uh, mom's taking to some of the race while the dad's doing extra shifts. And it's, it's like if you have the will um, and a little bit of talent, and you have that determination, you can go so far in life. Whether you want to be a professional athlete or not, it just shows you like it is an inspiring story. So it's really awesome that you're willing to share it, go down there because there might be kids there that aspire to be a professional rider, but they might not have the means, you know, they might not leave the country. 
Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And I, it's, it's, you know, I just, I just hate the game of, uh, what what do you have or or what you know having to have the shiny thing to do the the shiny tool to do the job so it's cool to go down there and just like kind of you know show that it's um like obviously for us we're showing up with a, a race team and a very shiny new bike huh? it's very shiny it's very shiny <laughs> but um just being there and like showing that it it is achievable like you're here i'm here at your race like you can do it from here. Like you can go this fast on this track or, you know, just, just being in being, I guess connected is, is pretty good. I don't really know the word to use for it, but you get the point. <laughs> oh, I hundred percent get there. the point. Yeah. And how being, many, being so how many riders were there? Like what was, what is the local scene like there? Like how many were from Guatemala? And obviously there was other places in Central America that people came in from. What was it like? Yeah. Um, for the most part, like, um, there, so there's two major races down there. I think Lo- Loic and Loris did the DH1 in Colombia last year, um, and they moved the DH1 to Guatemala this year and had a great venue for it. But there was only, like, 50, 50 dudes in the pro class, and for sure, like, within 30 seconds, there was, like, five to seven guys. Like, I think um, – I, I don't know if you know Mauricio Estrada. He's uh, – a I believe Colombian from origin and he's, he was, he was down there. I think he raced during your time. And uh, so that he was towards the the end of that like pack and he's, you know, later in his career, but um, there's like, you know, like I said, Camilo and a, and a few other pros that are uh, probably Pablo and few pros that are kind of on that pace and, and could qualify for a world cup. And so it was good to have a couple of dudes to like the race at the front of the pack and, those dudes will send it and they're good down there and they have a lot of pride. So you can't slouch to, to win one of those races because those dudes will lay it on the line. So. Yeah, definitely. But so you've mentioned, you've obviously told your story, but you mentioned, so you it was your mechanic. Who got you your first bike and how did you get to this first race? Like obviously we're turning uh, back time here and, and maybe there's, a, there's yeah. listeners here that don't have, know your story. So just whiz yeah, through that. So, yeah, you got you have a little different maybe audience than uh, with with your location than me with media up here in the U.S. But I mean maybe uh, some new listeners. So essentially, I was blue collar, <laughs> blue collar. Just I mean maybe maybe even not even blue collar racing motocross. Um, grew up and I was never great at it. Like I was never really anything special. Um, loved riding dirt bikes, grew up doing it and had some dirt jumps in my backyard. Like when my parents split, I just kind of dug, I was just trails kid, had a shovel in my hand all the time, had a little bit of place to build some jumps and, uh, started racing BMX cause I was really competitive. Um, always kind of had a competitive nature and rode skate park. I was from Michigan, so it snowed a lot. We rode skate parks all winter, raced BMX in the summer. We had a little indoor BMX track close. So it was one of the three places we could ride and did the, did the bicycle or the BMX thing for a while and got good enough to get a, a scholarship to a school in Kentucky called Lindsay Wilson. And there they had a, a mountain bike team. And I actually didn't get pulled onto the scholarship for riding BMX, it was for riding slalom. Um, cause I rode the slalom bike twice down the slalom course and they're like, yep, you got it. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, you should come race for us. So, and, and college racing is definitely, uh, a bit watered down compared to weight racing. A lot of the, the high level, um, nationals in America for downhill it's, you know, time on stopwatches and everybody rides either a dirt jumper or a trail bike. And some of them will ride downhill bikes if they have them. So it's just, kind of a different deal but there was this dude there um jd swangan and he was you know a, for a long time like second at junior worlds like the dudes were legit at riding a, a mountain bike and i kind of jumped on his slalom bike and could put some times close to his on the slalom track and it was like oh well maybe you could be good at this and then it quickly just blew like i mean like far past my expectation ever could be and um, my buddy, uh, helped me, uh, buy a down, buy a slalom bike. And then I saved up, scraped up a little bit of money and bought, um, like 
there was this kid, Shane Leslie in America, who was junior national champion and one of his race bikes that he had raced for two years. And then his dad raced for a year and then I bought it and I raced it for a year. And, uh, yeah, somehow it just kind of the snowball got rolling and I got a little bit of steam and then, um, won pro duel at Crankworks and, uh, yeah, beat a lot of heavy, heavy hitters and big names in the sport. And that kind of like opened the doors for me. That was like my, my shot, like my, my one shot to try to make it happen and it went really well and yeah the, the rest has kind of just been racing from there just continuing the, to try to open doors yeah and the industry clearly took note but did your self-belief start ticking over there like yeah it's slalom you're in downhill now and there isn't really slalom at any races now but yeah. is that kind of what you needed to see like you need to see it happen at one of these races to get the actual like internal belief yeah, and I, I, I top 10 at, like, a U.S. national and had, like, maybe some, like, decent times in the U.S. as a downhill racer. Like, I got sixth at my first U.S. national and beat a lot of dudes that were, like, had won U.S. national or pro GRTs or were, like, on pace on the national circuit. So that kind of helped, but I had to develop as a downhill racer and learn the – like, I was good at riding the bike, but I would just – ride really heavy, smash rims, run into stuff. And it was like the slalom gave me the opportunity to make a career, let's call it a career, as I developed as a downhill racer. So, and then it took me probably two years on the world stage to like figure out that style of racing as well, just because it's so different than racing in America. It's not a pump track. It's you're managing speed on rough tracks rather than just like trying to go faster and faster. Because I try to do the same thing over there and then explode. So it is a it's a lot of similarities. I I had the similar thing. Tracks at home, you have to just generate speed. Even Greg mentioned it. That's why he's so good at Maritzburg. And yes, it's a home track, but he's very good at going as fast as he can and making more speed. But when you've got to scrub speed or break later, like I struggled, you know, in the steeps at Morzine when I would ride with Brendan, like I could smoke him at certain tracks and yeah. keep up with him. And then there were certain tracks. I was like fish out of water before I got used to it, you know, how to late break and how to commit when it got, got really steep. And, and that's what world cup tracks kind of mostly are in places, you know? Yeah. I mean, I remember my first time over to Morzine and I'm dropping in, but behind Elliot, uh, Elliot Jackson in the wet and I'm crashing three times a run because you like hit something, get out of control and then hit the next thing. And then you're off the bike flipping through the woods and you're just like, how does anyone ride down this? And, and like to, to learn that you have to control your speed, be precise, like let off the brakes and, and be really good with your braking, your braking points. And that whole style of racing took me forever to figure out. So coming from like a BMX slalom background and like I could read terrain in on the motocross bike and pick good lines and carry momentum. But that whole style of racing just took me forever to develop. So it's just like a, yeah, it's a, that was kind of like, I did get some hope racing in America, having good results. Um, but it definitely was just the long, the long grind on the world cup circuit, trying to figure it out. Like how, how, how do I, it, it just seemed like I would crash or get 30th for like a, for a full season, I would put down the run of my life for 120th place and never qualify, like not even in the area code. And then I learned more about bike setup, got more comfortable with the grade of the terrain. And then it was like 30th place or crash. And then I got a top 15 and it was like, okay, I can, I can, you know, I'm, I'm getting better. And then I came into a season and, and was like, got a factory ride and got some support and then would, if I had the run of my life, I could get a podium or in the top 10, but I was kind of like a 15th place guy. So it was just like kind of every year, it's just taking that next step and, and learning. Um, because I think, you know, in this sport, the knowledge comes at a cost. And if someone spent the money and the time to learn that knowledge, they're not exactly trying to share to add a certain uh, point on the results list. Yeah, for sure. It, you've you've got to get it yourself. Experience doesn't come cheap, doesn't come easy. It comes from hitting the ground as well, making mistakes. And you didn't have like the junior races. I didn't either. I obviously raced quite a bit in South Africa, but 
I also went over afterwards as an elite. Now, if you think about these juniors, that's why like they're so used to winning. They're so used to believing that they're fast. Like you would have struggled with the belief that you belong because you weren't quite seeing it. You know, there was like spots of this potential, but you're like, shit, now I'm, I was 30th this week and now I'm like 60th or crashing like, oh shit, maybe I don't have it. So yeah, the learning curve at the World Cups, if you don't have that experience, is is steep. You almost have to prove it to yourself to believe it. I, I don't know. Some dudes have like an inflated ego and they have like this sense of confidence that they can do it and this like firm belief. But it's like, I almost have to like run into it, trip and fall down to like realize that like I'm at that level. And once you, but then once I do accomplish something, like if I get lucky and do it once, it becomes the new normal. And then I like create this, I don't believe it. I achieve it. And then it's the new normal and I'm trying to do it every time. And then I put so much pressure on myself that it's almost unsustainable to believe that like it's not going to be a, a bit of a roller coaster. Like I want to be like dungy and just be like there every weekend. But the reality is in our sport, it's not, I mean, there's a few dudes that are like that. Like Loris is always there. And I, I think he's, you know, a lot like that Loris, Bruni, but you're going to have crashes. You're going to, have a 30th place weekend like that kind of is unfortunately the nature of the sport like you're gonna fall down at some point and then like i just want it to be like sunshine all the time so <laughs> it's, it's hard to accept when it doesn't go your way but that's been you know like you said it's uh you it's it's just a different it's a different deal <laughs> but that's interesting because i heard I you speak about that there's a cost to sort of upping your expectations or a cost to running at the front of the pack. But I think now more than ever, it's not as easy as you say. There's not that many guys. Like Troy used to be this podium guy every race. Just put the $1,000 down. At the end of the season, he's got a handful of podiums. It used to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, the competition at the top is deeper, plus the competition from 10th to 30th is insane. So I think you're right. Like you, you have to manage those expectations, even if you've changed your belief system. And that's human nature. Dude, if you get a one podium, you're like, well, I want to back it up. Well, that's where I belong now. It's such a, such a fickle sort of sport. I think there's other sports where you can make more errors and come back, like motocross. Yeah. I mean, Villa Poto sp spoke about it, supercross versus motocross. He was more nervous in a supercross gate than he was in a motocross gate. He had more time. He had more time to show his potential. Yeah, I I mean, I'm a big motocross fan. Any, yeah. Anybody that, you know, listens to anything I talk about, I always relate it to moto. And, like, I, I love listening to, like, that Title 24 podcast with Ricky and Villapoto, and they talk about, like, you know, like, Lawrence saying he wants to try to get 72 Supercross wins. It's like, it, ain't, it isn't so easy. You can't come through the pack. And even then, you have way more time than downhill. Like, if in downhill, if we make a mistake, it's you're no, you it's very 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 difficult and you have to take a ton of risk to get that two seconds back you've messed up it's kind of like you almost just have to accept that it's gone and try to continue to be perfect and that's what you get i don't think i mean maybe if you look at um my crashing run at mount saint anne um you can look at it as i crashed and then i rode fast and i got sixth place or you can look at it as i lost that five to seven seconds and there's no way I could have got it back. And that was my pace from top to bottom. So there's kind of two ways. And I believe that I didn't really ride over my pace to the bottom because I did get a flat tire. And like, I was just riding my speed because I kind of knew it was over. It was the last race of the season and didn't roll down, but rode fast to the bottom. But it took me some time to recollect myself. And then you're at sixth place on the podium. Like, could I have won that day? Yeah, for sure. I believe I could have. But if you look at motocross, if you're in... Like, look at the days of Dungey where his bike didn't show up to the starting line and then he, he was almost a lap down, almost didn't get let off the track and then, you know, rode to the front of the pack. You you can't have – we don't have those, like, triumphant stories just because there's not enough time, you know. And our, our sport is so different from that. I think it is does relate more to Supercross, but they're still ta – we're talking a 15-minute main event, you know. We're racing for three. So it's just – yeah, I relate it back, but – um, it is, it is, it is different, man. Once that time's gone, you got to live with that. There's no getting that back. 
those uh those moments as a guy on the sidelines now and coach and i'll do line i, lo- I love doing it i'm not at all of them um and i try to add value where i can but i would coach someone and say the time's gone you can't get it back like factually the time has gone however you've just mentioned something you feel like you didn't ride faster but is the subconscious not kicking in where i know if i've made a mistake in the first two turns of a, of a downhill track like bah, you know if you've lost a second or two i think sometimes you switch trying to get it back and sometimes it works out to be consistent and not crash yes off. yeah it shuts off i'm like to be smart to be consistent for the overall shouldn't push too hard stay on the bike but sometimes you're like well i'm gonna try get it back and you probably ride that ragged edge and you can get, get away with it or you can crash again you know and when you when you crash again 100 yeah. percent you've you've tried to get it back and you shouldn't have in hindsight right yeah where there's you know there's multiple uh, you know if you look at like my season last year i crashed in the semifinal at snowshoe and i definitely rode the jagged edge qualified i don't i don't fifth something in the, in the let's call it the top six i don't remember what position it was but it was at the front of the pack and i think i maybe even qualified third with a crash at snowshoe fully laying on the ground into an uphill. Yeah, rode the jagged edge. Could I have won snowshoe? Maybe, maybe. If I, But if I could have maybe raced with my brain shut off, like if I can find a way to race in, in that headspace where my brain is shut off and I'm reacting, or reacting solely on instinct, like as if we see these amazing runs where your chain snaps and you're just like, you know, brain shuts off you go into a different place and you execute yeah maybe maybe that's maybe that's how you win how you get your brain to go there i have no idea i'm still trying to figure that out if anybody's got any info on how to get in that like i guess what you could call it is a flow state um or you know I, I don't really know what to even call that but yeah then maybe that's how you win races um but man it is hard to get there it is very, very difficult to get in that place where you're like, I went down, I got to go. Like, like, do or die, I'm not going to be in the final and my season's over. Like, that is a hard place to put yourself and a hard place to get mentally. I would argue that you didn't just get the time after the crash. It's because you were riding at such a good pace up until the crash and then you just lay lay it like a heater down after that. But I would say that that's because you don't care anymore, right? And that's what we're looking for. If you could get in the start gate and ride reactory, find the flow states, the runs where you don't care about the result are the ones where you do well. Like you either Dude. don't care at all and you're not feeling nervous and you ride slow because you don't give a shit or you don't give a shit about the result, the crashing, the anything, but in that moment. And and if you could bottle that flow state, bottle that energy and process, I'd be a rich man. If I could say, hey, I've got the secret sauce. But that's why I think you go racing. That's why sport is so fantastic because the person that should win on paper doesn't always win because it's you know, this so is, this mental. Is really, it's really good to talk about this. And, and this is like, you know, we do so. I do so many talk, podcasts, and we talk about all oh, your history and this and that, and and your results and boom, boom, boom. And it's like these are not the things that like I'm passionate about. And when we talk about racing and racecraft and and mental, the mental place of of riders, different riders, comparing scenarios, like for me, a lot of the time, like I've I've talked a lot on my podcast about like having to make it happen and like financially like betting on yourself and having to back that up sitting in the starting gate like there's a paycheck i'm going to get it and i at the same time we've we've talked about um you know different riders that are in different scenarios so yeah there's one you there's one way where you can force this like i need it i'm gonna make it happen i have to make it happen and then there's another situation that's like, let's call it Jackson, a lot of hype. Maybe he feels like he has to, but the reality is making good money, riding his bike, doesn't really have a care in the world. Maybe other than his own ego, 
gets in the starting gate, I'm just going to go go for the win. Or it or, or has an overwhelming self-belief that he's better than everybody and he should win. So are these things that like cause a rider to be better or able to achieve this I don't care, I don't give a shit attitude and just ride as fast as they possibly can? What what situation are people in that causes them to perform? Where like let's call maybe Greg last year when things are not going well, the or does he have the overwhelming self belief that he's done it before, he's just going to do it again, or does the train start to come off the tracks when he's having issues, and he he races either a like I need to do this, or I don't care anymore. I'm just going to go ride as fast as I can, and if it blows apart, like it's it is what it is. The season's already kind of in the hole. You know, and that mind state, how do you get there? What what environment causes you to be in the best place to race possible? And I know for me, like, if I can shut my brain off, I can ride so fast. But how do I shut my brain off? No, there's definitely been race runs where I'm in the starting gate and I'm cold, like numb. And like where I've said to myself, like, I always tell myself I don't like racing and I hate the pressure of what if like the pressure of, am I going to crash and my season's a wreck and am I going to have a ride next year? And like, am I going to, you know, be able to sign as a top guy? It's a contract year, all these factors, whatever, you know, you want to, you want to, you always want to have a good year on your contract year, you know, and there's always pressure to do that or if you're in a three-year deal for the first two years it's like you maybe you're in a position to wing it a bit more and go for wins or whatever the situation is but you know i've been sitting in the starting gate like cold numb nothing in my head i haven't talked i don't listen to music and i'm like i really like this and i've had some pretty sick runs in that state where you're like kind of for lack of a better term you're like let's fucking go and then it's it's just so everything is numb. And then I've also been in the starting gate and it's don't don't mess it up, you know? And and then you're like, how do you get yourself in this position? Or how do you find a way to just be okay with whatever? Like you're just and I think that's why Aaron did so good for so many years. And like or like because I've just had he's the only one I've had a lot of experience to that's raced at a high level and I've had a lot of like like genuine interaction with and he's like i'm just gonna go i want to win i'm gonna go for it and whatever happens i'm cool with and maybe that is the bit of a long rant but maybe that is the way you get to be the best racer 2024 is here in full swing and that means it's time for a new year's resolution check-in with our friends at manscape newsflash it's never too late to level up your grooming game and keep your bush tamed Manscaped's new lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good, turn the page on confidence this year. Whether you're going for a trim or that clean shaven look, this trimmer has you covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide, now is your time to get a grip on your grooming with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code MOVINGTHENEEDLE for 20% off and free shipping. The ball has dropped. But don't drop the ball on your balls. Introducing the MVP of 2024, Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower. It's not just a trimmer, it's your grooming sidekick. We all want to shave time off our race runs, but how about shaving the parts that really matter? Picture this, you're shredding down the gnarliest trails, feeling the wind in your hair, and then it hits you. You need to tame the beast below the belt. That's where Manscaped comes in. With a cutting edge technology and precision engineering, you can now groom with confidence, just like you conquer those downhill descents. And for my men who want the full grooming experience, look no further than Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0. In this grooming kit, you'll get the trusted lawnmower, and that's not all, Manscaped's ear and nose trimmer, and the essential aftercare products with a crop soother, ball aftershave lotion, and crop preserver. Anti-chafing ball deodorant. Yeah, it's deodorant for your balls. I bet you didn't think you needed that. And folks, this isn't just any trimmer. It's got skin-safe technology to prevent nicks and snags in those delicate areas. 
Seriously, I've been testing this bad boy and not one nick down there. It's waterproof so you can take it from the trail to the shower without missing a beat. Constant motor is like the turbo boost for your nether regions, ensuring you'll be flying down those trails in record time. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code MOVINGTHENEEDLE at manscaped.com. Embrace a new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer, courtesy of Manscaped. This part, I love this shit probably as much as you do. That's why I still, <laughs> I do the race reviews. And like for me, when, when I was commentating a lot, that's what I think we miss is everything outside of the bicycle outside of the track like that influences the race trouble at home mindset contract who's got a ride secured who hasn't like you you mentioned a whole lot of examples so and maybe i'll just jump into a few and we can spitball them but jackson to yeah. me luck luckily i think doesn't summer have the pressure because maybe he knows he's got so many years ahead of himself that's what i would be telling him like he seems to say that in the interviews, like he kind of knows he's got 10 years at this pace. So if he doesn't win the title this year, who gives a shit? And, and it was quite awesome that he, you know, like Jordan won the first race. You know, that could have been Jackson, but he was ill and he was patient enough and it came. So that's him. Greg, on the other hand, I think Greg, that's why he's still going. This He needs to be the underdog. The old guy is always the underdog. Hey, you're washed up. Hey, you're old. No way is it going to work. He loves having problems with the bikes. And he's like, I'll show you. Like, he needs more pressure because, dude, how do you get a motivator if you've been doing it for this many years? Like Jordan, Michael Jordan, the basketball player. You, I don't know if you've watched that. He mm -hmm. used to have to make issues with opponents because he's like, I'm going to beat your ass now. Like, he needed to fabricate yeah. motivation. Someone like you, I'm hearing. I had some similar noises in my head at the top of the races. Uh, maybe that's why I did better at a US Open versus every World Cup, you know, or I heard you say <laughs> you saw some splits um, where you were up and Martin, I don't know if he's told you, I've told the story, like we used to have split boards and I qualified fourth, so I'm down fourth last. The split's green halfway down the track. Dude, I bottled it. I got tight. I was like, if the split's green, that means I'm faster than everyone at the bottom. Of the so my, head, my mind got a hit. Um, and we're doing a few different examples, but I spotted a mile away. Like you guys, the guys that got told early you needed a ride, a lot of you guys performed this past year. Simple as fact. You were riding for your livelihood. For sure. And that can no work doubt. for a lot. And it can really like it can really come and haunt you if you if you don't handle it very well. Dude, I, I feel like I've been riding for my livelihood for like the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to open the podcast. How does it feel signing a deal uh, a little earlier than two weeks before the race season? Dude. Hey, relief? I tell you what, I, you know, I've talked about it a lot, whatever, you know, it's like, it's, I don't, you're not beating the dead horse, but keep signing another kid. I'm going to keep beating the next kid. You know, Love like it. that's where I'm at. Like you, you know, like, it. It, it is so hard to get to the top of this sport. And Jackson, Jordan, they were both there as 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 at the end of Enjoy like not to talk about those two, but those are the two last two that come up. Like they were, you know, putting winning, if not close to winning race run times down. We knew they were gonna come in and be win contenders, top ten guys. Yeah, when they have to pay their own mortgage and they buy their first house and they got a truck payment, maybe we'll see how fast they go. You know, like when when it when it comes time to be on your own and and have consequences if you fall down. But they're they kind of you know came in and they're gonna be be there. You know, like they're signing good contracts. They're really wanted. But man, the race for the next kid at the World Cups. It's like you know how hard it is to get here. Why don't you support the dudes that have already proven that? They have the mind to do it. They have the work ethic. Like, it's just the next kid, the next kid, the next kid. And, and I get it, and it is the race right now. And, and, you know, we have a lot of good ones. Like, this this kid, Asa, from the U.S. is legit, dude. He's really, really good. He rides fast. 
and he rides a race run five out of seven runs and consistently put down times. And he's, he's, they're really good. We, you know, my teammate, Ryan Pinkerton, he's a lethal dude. He's legit. He's like lethal. they're really fast kids. But when the rubber hits the road and like, you know, you get put in these situations, like there are some dudes that have proven that they can do it and don't necessarily have like the support because there's always a race for the next kid. You know, so. Yeah, like what are they going to do when times get really tough? Like you say, that was a that was yeah. well said. Like when there's a mortgage payment, car payment, the first injury. When, you, when you're an like, adult, we don't like we don't <laughs> know we don't know how they will react, and these things will happen. Yeah. And yeah. and I agree. You know. Like why is it so? It's like the excitement, like a new shiny object, <laughs> but with the youngsters. And like you said, there's definitely many of them deserve it, and that's not what you're saying. But at the end of the day, I mean, is it because they're saving money hiring young? Like, is it the paycheck thing as well? Like, some of these teams don't have the budget. What, like, where does this come from? Uh, yeah, I, no, I don't think it's real. I don't think it's a money thing. I just think they want the like Jackson and Jordan proved to be legit, and I think they all think the next kid is going to be Jackson or Jordan. Those two dudes are so legit. Ryan, Ryan Pinkerton's legit. I mean, we'll see, you know, if he goes to be competitive in the elite class, I think he's going to be pretty close. I don't think he's going to come in and win the first race like Jordan, but I think jo Jackson and Jordan sparked like that fire for sure of like, you can get the next junior and, ha oh, and even Finn. But I think those three have been super unique. Like Finn was really fast and came in, but even Finn took a while to be where he is now and now he's like dude he's really good he's really really good and jordan's really good but you've even seen like jordan won the first race but he's been kind of back and forth he'll be on fire one weekend and then maybe not be as hot the next weekend where jackson i mean i he's i mean it's he's incredibly talented like, you know he's going to be there just based upon pure talent. I mean, he went through pretty much hell last year and, and was, you know, at the front of the pack, even after he had been in a hospital bed for how long. So it, it's I think that sparks the interest from the industry just because they continue to think. But, I mean, they've bet on a lot of kids that haven't made it too. So um, for me, I always – I just – I don't know. I think I like the underdog mentality. So maybe I make it up to be more than it is in my head, even but just because I, I dig it. I, I just want to, you know, I want to beat the dude with the hype. And that's just, just maybe it is because I didn't have that. I didn't come through juniors. I didn't get the hype. Nobody was betting on me to win. And then maybe that is why I like, I like that mentality so much. Maybe that's what I use to motivate myself. I don't know, but I will say that, the industry does like the next kid and it's it's motivating for sure yeah well it's it sounds like it motivates you and and as and why not as it should i think you've we've just figured out it does and that's a nothing wrong with being motivated by that isn't it you know a little chip on yeah. the shoulder like hey i love it keep hiring the young kid and i'll keep beating the young kid like that's <laughs> betting on yourself trying to keep trying, keep trying yeah but to. i mean which what you got to tell yourself? Right? I respect that. I I find it very difficult to be outwardly cocky, and and I think Jordan Williams, like his world's post, I I respect because I would never be able to post that. I was like, if I post that, I'm putting so much pressure on myself, and I like that's where I have respect. I'm like, this kid wants the pressure, like by putting mm -hmm. that out into the universe, Loic seeing it, you're seeing it. I'm like, this guy's claiming he wants rainbow stripes already. I'm like, good for you. Uh, interesting yeah. strategy because you bring more and, pressure and maybe on yourself. Do I, do I relate the next kid as Jackson and Jordan? I don't know. You know, there's definitely some young kids coming up in America that like you want to try to continue to beat them. You know, you don't want to let them be you because it's, I think you can relate with your career. Like I go to a U.S. national and I'm trying to win the U.S. national. I'm not trying to get beat by the kid that has all the hype that, is the junior or is racing the elite class, but is not pro yet. He's still a junior like, you know, and, and they get like so much energy behind them and everyone talks and it's almost like a bigger deal. If you don't win, 
than if you do win. You know, hundred oh, percent. Yeah, hundred percent. It's I hated riding local races. Hated it. I I I hate. <laughs> I, I would just because you know like people get so excited and I and I don't even compare the like beating the next kid to like when I say that I'm not necessarily saying Jackson or Jordan because they're legit. They're elites. They're legit competitors in the sport. But it's it's um where where the hype is for the for the next kid coming up like yeah i'm gonna try to beat that kid and i'm gonna try to stay at the top for as long as i can like or as close as i can to it i mean luca is an, another american rider that is so good like really 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 good and we compete when when i i know when charlie harrison was racing when he showed up if my run wasn't perfect he was gonna beat me because he was gonna show up every time and he was going to be within a second every time. And that's like, I like that competitive nature, but I don't like the hype for the, the, the hype for the younger kid or the next junior X kid or whatever. I don't, I, I just think once you get into a career as an adult racing elite, it's different for sure. So, and all, and all the top guys like in our sport are, are there, but you know, and it's not even that like, like I, I'm for sure definitely not the most confident rider. Like I, I have to re, every year remind myself. Like it's like you go away for two months and you forget who you are or what you what you're capable of or what, how fast you can ride. And you have to like I I lost a stopwatch race the other week here because I blew off the track. Just like a Sunday stopwatch race, blew off the track. Like got going was a second off on a one minute track and was in the weeds. You know, so it's like you have to like remind yourself every year, and that's why we do preseason racing. But I will say that being like having Aaron believe in me in the last the last couple years was really cool, and that really helped build my character and build me as as a rider and a racer. And now being in a position, I feel like, am I saying I'm the leader of the Mondraker factory racing team? No, but I am the most, um, the highest in the world cup overall last year. And I, I have the most experience on the team and to see them kind of bet on me, that was really motivating for me. And it's made me want to put as much into my off season as I can to be like, it's motivating when somebody bets on you and, and puts trust in you and invests in you. And it makes you want to work really hard. Yeah, man, and you you deserve every bit of that. And uh, and these kids that are on the team, like you say, they're legit. You think like they're gonna keep you young per se, and like f- like you say, fired up in the offseason. Because on paper, you are the leader of the team. You're the older guy on the team, got the most results. The young bucks are gonna be hungry. But I like that. Like I think having a young son team is good. It keeps, I mean, you've talked about it. Like these guys are going Hail Mary at the test camp and you're like, dude, the World Cup's in three months, but you have at it. Like that takes experience yeah. to go, you can win testing, you go for it. But probably internally, you're like riding a little quicker and just keeping an eye on it. And I think it'll motivate you. <laughs> yeah, I think completely. Like, I mean, I had Danny Hart as a teammate, dude. That guy goes flat out all day, every day, every run. So uh, yeah. I, I, I know what you're going through. Yeah. And, you know, like watching, you know, all the pre preseason racing, like even like with Ryan, with Asa in the United States there, I, I think those two are the next two kids, you know, like when I relate to, I don't necessarily think, like I said, not Jackson and Jordan, I think like, you know, Asa and, and Ryan and even on our team, Ronan, the Irish kid is legit. He's so fast. Um, crazy fast winging at every practice run ryan's wide open every practice run so like by having those two in america for the preseason racing like when we get over to the big boy track where you got to be really strong and big compressions and fit and we'll see where they're at um but racing in america dude they are where there's not a lot to separate people they are legit so fast so i think that'll even be good too getting getting into the race season with preseason racing i got to race Ryan and Ronan last week um, in Guatemala, and then I'll get to race, uh, you know, Asa at the the, the Tennessee National in, a, in a, coming, a couple weeks coming up, and and Ryan will be there as well. So Luca, I'm sure, will be there. He's like crazy fast. Um, it's so it'll be yeah, it's good to have like that competition to like kind of get you running into the season and and hold you accountable because 
I wouldn't want to ride that fast until the World Cups. Like you have to do a couple fast runs for preseason racing, but I test at 80%. I ride at 80% all the time. Um, I don't ride at 100%. I like to manage risk as I get older. I just know that I, I'm not going to move well in the gym if I hit the ground. I can't pedal if my wrist is sore. And then you are you don't want to do those long runs. So I try to stay as healthy as I can till the World Cups and manage risk the best I can. But even like last week, I had to ride a bit faster than I wanted to with those two there. And that was like, it's good. I think that is, is good to – because I am prideful. I want to win. I don't want to get beat. So that pushes me kind of out of my comfort zone of how fast I would normally ride. But how do you draw the line then if maybe it isn't the time to go that quick and you have to get third? Or are you saying, I can't do that anymore? <laughs> you know, because if it's exactly. preseason and the objective is to set up, set up suspension or do something else or your trainer says, I just want you to do a lot of practice runs or unfortunately now with those guys at the race, are you going, I'm just going to take it as a race? Like, do you, you split ever, those? Because sometimes seen... I would just, I would have such a hard training block. If I got beat, I got beat. I'm like, you take the national champs and you take the sleeve. Like, it's not my goal. The goal is the World Cup. You ever seen Loic let anyone beat him? Ever? Yeah, ever. it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah, when there's a, <laughs> when there's a stopwatch, there's a stopwatch, eh? So it's a tough one. When he races, he races the win, doesn't he? You know, yeah, I mean, I, I think say that, and I'm like, even if I was tired, I'm like, I'm going to have to find something here, aren't you? Old, the old man has to pull a, a couple of tricks out of his <laughs> all the time. Pull you a know? rabbit out of a hat. Oh, last week I found a couple, on race morning, I was found a couple lines, and I was like, all right, that's maybe a second. Uh, maybe I can make up a half second here. Maybe you don't have to push so hard in the rod garden, get the exit good, you know, make it up on the pedals. You know, that's where... I was like, oh, it was a big push to the start. I was like, ah, oh, well, I can save some energy. I'll skip the first two corners, a couple of laps, and jump in and not push to the top every on race day. You know, it's it's the the old dog. The old dog comes out, and usually you can find a little something. But but that's the thing. I I think you know from what I've heard from Stevie, that dude, if it was a race run, no matter what happened, if the the air wasn't in the tire. He was riding as fast as he could. And I think that Loic has that same mentality. Like, that dude does not like to get beat. Like, and when it comes down to putting it down, like, he's, he, he has the head for it. And I think that that's the part that you, you, which, which makes, you know, you, you relate back to like, you know, the Michael Jordan documentary. You go back, I talk about listening to that Title 24 podcast. Yeah, on the broadcast on Supercross, Ricky's normal. But when you get those two that have that many career accolades, and we're talking about American Supercross racing, but like when they're raw and they're, for lack of a better term, pretty gnarly, like when they're like, oh man, I wouldn't have let that happen. And they talk about their careers and, and man, you look at the best riders in the sport. And I, I realize downhill is a little bit different than basketball but those dudes or or motocross but those dudes are like championship minded they are absolutely elite when it comes to mental strength and i think that's something you see like with a rider like like who's done it year after year after year that dude's headspace is amazing and that, and maybe that is that overwhelming self-belief is what helps win a championship or believe you're going to be there every weekend or you know, when we say it's like, are you, are you cocky or are you confident? I think that there's a, there's a line to run. And I think that Loic does a great job of it, of like, he's a really nice guy. He's humble, but he's a killer. <laughs> like when it comes oh, 100%, to like man. race run, he is, he is an absolute savage. So, and I love, dude, I dig that. I love that. When I listen to like that, that other podcast, listen to Villapoto, listen to RC, like that, that stuff gets me fired up. <laughs> I enjoy it. What? So obviously you've spoken a lot about being on Gwyn's team and, and teammates. And then technically I think he, well, he mentored you when he wasn't able to race. But would you say you learned more yeah. from him off the bike mentally or on the bike? Because off I think bike. a lot of people, I thought so as well, I thought a lot of people would love to be 
near him and see him ride and how does he go so fast and how does he do this and that's equally impressive what he brought to the sport the strength and just murdering tracks but i was way more impressed on these world cup seasons with that championship mindset and the way he got down the hill and fulfilled so close to his p- potential so often yeah yeah i think it's he definitely has like an, an overwhelming self belief and like being around him, I see like the big picture of like how he operates, and and that was really cool. And I can ride with him. I, and there's not a lot of people in the world that can hang on to Aaron Gwynn for a full run. They don't get to see it because they can't stay on his wheel. And I was able to ride at the same. There's been days for sure he's fully rode off my wheel. Like like I I don't have it today. I can't even hang. Like for sure. And that's where like people are like, oh Aaron this, Aaron that, and I'm like, dude, at the test track. I'm telling you right now, the dude is so legit. Like, he is so fast, he's ready to win a World Cup, 100%. And there's not, like, I can ride off people's wheels, and if I want to, I can lay it down and put four corners together and break away from somebody. But there's been days that Aaron has fully, like, I'm like, dude, you can have it. Like, I'm good. Like, I'm not riding that fast today. See you later. And, uh, but his head, his head, his mind mind is so strong like he's he's fit he's strong but he's he's his head is in a really good place and that's what's mentored me the most like and and i guess like i i want to win i believe i should win i believe you know these like i guess i don't believe i should win maybe at the world cup level i still have to maybe unlock that and maybe that is the thing i'm missing is the belief that i can win that i i think that i'm starting to get for the first time ever, like I said, I have to trip and like fall down. Like if you look at the splits, you look at the times I can win. And that's you like, like, like have to win the race. You'd be like, Oh, I can win. I have to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally, I feel like that's literally what has to happen for me to believe I can start. Winning. And Ludenville didn't make so you believe silly. it. Like I thought the way you wrote it, Ludenville, uh, I'm, I'm like, s- I know that's a I'm touchy a subject, salty. but like you can win. <laughs> you're, if you can get sick and you can win. Wound. Yeah. But if you can get uh, sick and you can win. Does it? Yeah, doesn't, I don't know. So that doesn't help you with your belief. Is was the track better for me? Was it? Did it roll faster? Did like have more grip at the end of the day? I don't know. I, I can't tell you. I but I didn't believe I was winning at that rate. I mean, yeah, if I wouldn't have rode halfway off the like fully blew that off camp, jumped past the off camber, went low, drifted, came to a stop, got going again, I would have won the race. If I didn't tip over in that corner at Mount Saint Anne. Probably could have won the race, you know? Yeah, that's, I mean, I guess I just have to, I, that is what I'm, when I say I'm starting to believe, but I almost feel like to view myself as a race winner, I have to win a race and that's, I'm, I'm working, uh, you know, and I'm, Mm. I'm trying to, like I said, I came into the sport late. I am getting to be better mentally and that's been very difficult to take an average dude and compete with guys that have been in this situation for 20 years or 15 years whatever you know greg's forever there's kids that have done it through juniors and are now elites maybe maybe they're five to seven years whatever whatever the situation is i wasn't a born and bred athlete and i've had to work mentally to be the best version of myself and believing in myself. And, and like, even like Loic is like, I guess says Loris is more like I am um, where Loic is, I think very mentally strong. Like, I don't know for, for a fact, I don't, I don't, I've never even really talked to Loris, but that's just what Loic has said. He's like, man, what are you doing? But I am putting so much work into being after spending time with Aaron a happier version of myself and a more believing version of myself and that's been through mental coaching that's been through um digging deep into myself and understanding what I'm doing that I need to change so like as a racer you're always in this constant um, mental place of like a growth. You're always trying to become fitter. 
You're always become, trying to become stronger. You're, but like, I've had to really break myself down and ask what makes myself happy. And because it was, I feel like it was at the point where I was so miserable racing that I didn't want to race anymore. I was like, if I'm going to continue to be here, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I have to walk away from this because I put so much pressure on myself that I was just so angry all the time. And it's come to the point where like I've loosened up. I've given myself a lot of like, like room to grow. And now I'm happier doing what I'm doing. And I believe that if I can find a way to be happy doing what I'm doing, I'm going to achieve the results that I want rather than just being miserable all the time. Like always on the head of the nail, like always putting so much pressure on yourself, always trying to make it happen even when it's not going your way. Like as I get older and in my career, I'm just trying to enjoy it where I think that that's going to maybe lead me more. And that's a lot of what I've taken from Aaron. It's just understanding it's all good. You're good. Dude, he looks he looks like he's so good at doing that. Or on the from the outside. And and that's there's so many similarities. Like if I tell my younger self something about my career, I'd say, dude, stop, smell the roses, try and enjoy it a little bit more. I mean, I had a great time. It looked like I was having fun, right? If you saw me at the races and but dude, the amount of pressure I put on myself and how self critical I was and Dude, and you said a good thing. Hard. You're like, it comes with consequences to be a podium rider. It comes with consequences to try win a race. Like, if you're going to ride that fast, are you telling me you're going to have clean runs the whole season? Like, so then how can you not accept what comes with that? You know, like the best of the best is to win the race. And with that, you're going to have all these issues. But so when did you have this sort of like talk to yourself? Like how long ago was it where you're like, I need to sort this out because I'm so unhappy here. I probably can't continue this. Um, man. When did I make a change? About when I hit about Val de Sol last year, when I didn't even qualify for the final, I was like, just put my hands up in the air. I was like, you know what? I'm done living like this. I'm done being this miserable. Um, but yeah, I started like maybe at the end of my midway, when I was at YT, um, riding for Martin Whiteley's program, I, I started making changes for sure. And I've, and I've made both from like, um, maybe separating myself from a lot of people that, I wasn't necessarily happy with and that like created a lot of friction and that led to me maybe being a bit of a, like an outsider, like a, like a very, very by myself for a while. And when I got on Aaron's program, like I started to maybe enjoy, enjoy some things, but I was still kind of miserable. Like when I was comparing what I had to work with, with others. And I guess going into the last season, um, going into the year, I was definitely a lot better. And then like in, in a better mind space, like after I podiumed at Val de Sol and going into the season, I was still really, before that I was really angry. And then I was like, maybe a, a lot less angry. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. But when things, like I went from ending the season on this high note and then I trained super hard and I thought that I could be in the mix and then it just went haywire. And in the middle of last year, I was just like, I am so done living like this. Like I'm done being miserable all the time. And it was like maybe like two years of growth. And now I'm kind of just okay with, giving my like I'm I'm okay with what I'm doing and my best effort and I just am more okay I guess I don't really know how to explain that to, or how I can explain that to someone like I just accept that I'm gonna give it my best effort and I'm gonna enjoy my life and enjoy what I'm doing and if it doesn't go my way then it's okay like Go, go, like, even like Aaron sent me a message before last week. He's my, I said, man, 
I was just chatting with him. I was like, yo, the kids are rolling. It's going to be a fight tomorrow. And he's like, man, don't worry about them kids. Give it your best, best run you got and call it a day. And that's kind of, I'm, I'm working on my health. I'm working on my mental state. I'm riding my dirt bike. I'm hanging out with my dog. I'm, my girlfriend's awesome. I have so many good things going on that like, I, I find it hard to believe that that environment is not going to make me happier and, and a better racer. I have a team that we're doing a ton of work where we're doing all I've wanted in terms of testing. Like, like, I mean, not like, it's not like I'm living, you know, testing every day, but um, the team's proactive. They're putting their best foot forward to make sure I'm prepared, which is awesome. We're, we did a test camp super early. We did a preseason race. I'm, I, I have more support going into the season than I've ever had. Um, yeah, you know, so that's like, I, I, for a long time, I felt like to get the things you wanted, you had to do it through the front of the results list. And, and even no matter how good I finished, it was never enough. Like I was never happy. And then I just kind of decided that like, you just need to be happy with what you're doing. Like if you, if you genuinely enjoy the process and you enjoy what you're doing and you find a way to, like, I think Troy said it the best if you find a way to love the races, then you'll enjoy being there and you'll get better results rather than just like being afraid of what if all the time and being angry about things that you can't control. Like there's no, no reason like there's it's good book. I guess it just comes from fear of perception too. So like you, I, I you've been through it. It's hard to explain it to anybody the fear of perception of what's, yeah. what's happening because nobody really knows you like some things you just kind of have to take it on the chin and just, it is what it is. Do the best you can and keep moving. Yeah. I think that's what Gwyn has obviously done so well through all these injuries and all these things that caused issues with his race results. And, and I can see, you seem like there's a lot of emotion that, that I'm feeling right. And, and you've had, these factory teams that have folded and folded and like late, you know, like signings to these teams, like how is it easy to have belief that you're one of the guys? If every time there's like a contract cycle, you're like, okay, but I did have results and I put my effort in and I'm trying and I'm, I'm not getting hired. Like that must be pretty hard, you know, to have that sort I, of self belief as well. It's not like anyone didn't want to hire me. At the end of the day, you have your budget. You set yourself up. Or everybody wants to set themselves up early. They hire their riders, and they're good. And if you're on the outside of that, it's not like they don't like you, or it's not like it's just like a matter of circumstance. And it's like when you're pushing as hard as you can, and you're trying to make it happen, and it doesn't work out. I mean, it's not personal. It's just business. Yeah, but that I seems mean, like something you've learned to understand. Like, yeah. was it like that I've four had, years I've ago? Had... Like four years years ago, <laughs> no, you might dude. have internalized and said, fuck, no one likes me or they don't feel I'm good enough. Now you seem content and sort of humble in how good you are in the sport. You know, I, I try to be like so politically correct on these things, but when you're <laughs> you like- You don't have rolling... to, it's my podcast. <laughs> when, I'm teasing, don't get yourself you're, fired. When you're... <laughs> no, but when you're, no, not even that, just like, I, I try to be nice and humble and but when you're walking around every day just screaming fuck in your head and everything is going wrong and you just want to fucking throw shit and you're like then that's it like, sorry i probably shouldn't say that but literally everything is going wrong and you're just like screaming fuck in your head over and over and over again every day it's hard to be happy it's hard to be healthy it's hard to be mentally in a good place when everything is hitting the fan and there's nothing you can do and you're just like you don't even know what to do and you're just, but that's, that's being an adult. Like that's, this is, that is, and, and it's obviously in a better place now, found a way to deal with it, found a way through hard situations. And as I get older, I'm like, you know, it's okay. I, it was way worse 10 years ago. Like it was way worse, you know? And it's like, these are like, you think that dudes that are running million dollar corporations or running the bike companies after COVID are not doing the same thing. This is life. These are hard things that you have to deal with that make you a better person. These are situations that are, are molding me and growing me into, to be a way better version of myself. But when you're in it, <laughs> you're like, 
dude. <laughs> it, it's always easier when <laughs> when it's going your way and you're catching green lights, but that doesn't that doesn't grow you to be a better version of yourself. That doesn't like I've been through these hard things and I'm a better person. And yeah, it sucks when the money runs out and it's getting lean and 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 you're like wondering how you're going to make it work and wondering if you're going to, if you're privateer in the next year, I mean, wondering if you're privateer in the next year, you do ask yourself these things. Does no one like me? What can I, am I just not like, what have I not, what can I do more? And then you just continue to add more and more and more pressure. And that sucks. And that makes you miserable. And that's a terrible situation to be in. But sometimes, you know, we, we just, we live in a world of comfort. Everything we do is to make ourselves more comfortable. I constantly want to make my training easier. I want to go somewhere where it's sunny and I can just dust my bike off after and I don't have to clean all my muddy stuff up. And, you know, I want a garage that's heated and cooled and it's always nice to work on my stuff. Yeah, I want all these things. So it's a constant a constant chase for comfort, but that is not making you better. And, and that and then, this situ, you know, when you look at these situations that are difficult, I don't like having difficult talks. I've had to have a lot of them, <laughs> you know, I'm getting better at them, you know, maybe someday I'll need to fire somebody. Maybe someday I'll own my company and I'll have to manage things better. And, and, and whatever I choose to do, I'll be better at it because of it, because I've been put in these situations that well suck. But at the end of the day, I get to race my bike. I really enjoy it. And it, Aaron asked me this question. He's like, yeah, dude, well, if, say it all goes to shit. Say it, it all falls apart. Next year, you're renovating houses like you are right now. <laughs> and like, because I, I renovated my own home. Yeah, that was a great, I picked a great time to do it. Buy your first home, COVID melts down and uh, the, the whole world went belly up. But, you know, I went through that tough situation. I enjoyed it. Rode my dirt bike on the weekends, you know, through COVID was renovating my house. I really, I still enjoyed my life. I still enjoyed what I was doing. Yeah, it might have been difficult in that situation financially. It's very difficult, but I'm better now. And if I, and if this whole thing melted down, I'd probably just do the same thing. Ride my dirt bike on the weekends with my buddies, ride pit bikes on Thursday night. I'd work a job from nine to five that at five I got off. I wouldn't have to, you know, worry about a lot of other stuff. It's just, Life goes on. It's all good. You know, like you're going to find a way to enjoy what you're doing, no matter what you're doing. And I get to do this really cool thing. So enjoy it. Like, and that's been, that's been a lot of that realization at the middle of last year. It's like it's all good. Like it's going to be good no matter what. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. But that's, that's some experience, man. Gwyn has definitely helped you a lot. I can hear it and uh, I'm sure you're thankful for it, but two things popped to mind, like you played worst case scenario. Gwyn's tested you on that. It's like, okay, so worst case, it goes to shit. What is the what is the worst case? It goes to shit. You have to get a normal job, maybe renovate houses because you have some experience and you get a paycheck for that. Like, can you live with that? It's like, well, yes, I can. Like, technically I can. I'll probably get used to it. You're like, okay, well, if you can deal with worst case, why don't you just go down this road? Even if it fails, you're happy enough with worst case. And I don't think people Give play worst. I don't think people play worst case scenario enough. Like Tim Ferriss has kind of made it quite a famous thing in his books and his podcasts. It's like we need to make a decision. If something fails, he's like, what will worst case be if this decision fails? Can you live with that? But, but you have to be honest with yourself if you can live with the worst case. If you can, cool. And the other thing is look down sometimes. I think you might have learned that. Like it's been worse for me 10 years ago as well as like if you look down, there's how many races below me in the rankings. Like I'm better off than them. Sometimes you actually have to look down, not up. Um, and I think that's like it's the expectation of, of happiness um, is if you're – like expectations versus reality don't match each other very well. That's when you're just deeply unhappy consistently. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it is really easy as an athlete to be deeply unhappy. Well, like, of course, like the only like... thing that people look at are results. Like you're in a results driven sport, eight races hmm. a year. What else did you do? Uh, I've got, you know what people were saying to me <laughs> middle of last year, didn't qualify at Val de Sol. Went out in the semifinal, rode off the side of the track. 
got stuck in the tape. Let let Tebow go past me. He was the next one to qualify. Rode down and caught him. Pissed. Season has fallen apart. Overall, all my goals in the overall out the window that I still ended up somehow achieving. Wanted to be top 10 in the overall. And everyone says to me, man, you're killing it this season. Good job. You're doing so awesome. And I'm like, you, you have no clue. Nobody has any clue. Nobody, like, even if you watch the races, they don't even know. So who cares? Like, <laughs> I, it's, I've crashed. I'm, I'm, I'm unprotected. I'm out of the back. You know, every, I work, worked for, you know, six months to try to be the dude and done everything I possibly can. And it's all went to shit. And people are still saying, yeah, dude, you're awesome. <laughs> I'm like, Nobody even pays attention, so why do I care so much? Like, why do I? There's no reason. Let's just go race. Like, okay. And that was like, that was like, whoever said that to me, I always want to high five them because I'm like, it just made me realize that it literally does not matter. <laughs> like, the only person that it matters is you. Like, we come down from qualifying, you crash, it's you're out of the race, it always went to shit. You're people are punching the handlebars and you stand at the bottom and you're like, Oh, that didn't go well for him. Oh, next guy. <laughs> it's like, it's so personal. Cause you're in this moment. It's and actually it's like so surreal. So eh? And then, but if you're the dude standing at the bottom, Oh, 10 seconds back. Okay. Next guy. Oh yeah. He did good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he beat him. And it's like, it, it, it literally, it literally does not matter. You just give it your best effort. As long as you're happy. The only the only person that takes it as personal as you is you. Race your bike, have fun, enjoy doing it. That's it. Like it's so it is really simple, and and that's I mean I maybe should replay this, put it maybe as my ringtone. Yeah, do you want me phone. to clip it? So it I'll clip this for you. <laughs> one seventeen to one nineteen. I'll get my producer to clip it for you, and uh, I'll send it back to you. But you have to yeah. you have to remind yourself that. I shit you not. Yeah. Because the next yeah. race that you don't get the result you deserve or felt you deserve or expect or was showing promise because the speeds were at the splits, you're going to feel just as shit, but you're probably going to get over it a lot quicker. Doesn't mean you're not going to be angry. Doesn't mean you're not going to be frustrated, but you probably get over it quicker and deal with it better. Putting yourself like uh, the more I continue to go maybe I grow up get older you know understand how cool it is what I'm doing that it's and try to be put myself in a position to be a happier version of myself try to become fitter try to eat better food try to move better try to do all these things that my my journey of bettering myself and exposure like I'm exposed to all these incredible individuals that are so knowledgeable and have so much experience and have been in all these hard situations and give me this amazing advice. And you go through like this exposure and you just realize like I'm doing okay. Like I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. Like my life is it's pretty cool. Like I'm, I'm very lucky. And, and the more I get, surrounded by normal people or what like where I would have been where I could perceive myself if this whole thing didn't happen like I have so much more going for me going into the rest of my life that is going to set me up to help be more successful that um like racing wise it, it's making I feel like personally it's making the racing easier for me like making me enjoy the racing more making the racing easier not helping me be able to get like that thing we talked about earlier where you get in the starting gate and you're like yeah like let's i'm stoked i'm excited and that's cool like that's a cool place to be because for so long in my career i'd get in that starting gate and be like i'm so sick of in my situation i have to find a way to change it and that's that's a powerful a powerful place to be. And I, I think it's like pretty interesting. And even you, like 
we listen to a lot of podcasts and, you know, I pretty much for the most part work around my house and I always has have headphones in trying to learn, trying to listen to a podcast, you know, you're, you're, you've had a long successful career, but what I find really interesting is that we're in a 25 year old sport. If you look at motocross, a dude like Dylan Ferrandis has David Villeman who's helping him as a, like a, a riding coach and, and maybe, um, helps coach him through some of the like the ins and outs of like the mistakes maybe David made in his career, or the things he didn't benefit enough or learned. You know, we we look we don't a lot of these riders don't really have a great system for mentorship, which I find so cool. Like being able to be in in the position I'm in now, I've learned a lot in my career, and like you know, having some riders to kind of give that back to, but it's, I think it's the same thing, like finding that. I think Aaron has definitely found a lot of enjoyment out of that. And I find it really, really interesting. You know, like I've talked even on this podcast a lot about like mental state and, and growing growth as an athlete and growth as a person. Um, And just, I think it's really cool to find the value in talking to more successful people and understanding more about what their careers have looked like and the things that like, like obviously I've shared a lot of my very personal stuff about like my life, even on this podcast, but it's really cool to get to get more experience about that and listen to like different, different high level athletes and how they've gone about their careers. I've I've been become so passionate about that. Yeah. Likewise, man. I, I did the same. That's where this podcast comes from because I listen to so many podcasts. I'm the same, like it's bad, but there's not like five minutes go by. I'm like audiobook podcast before this, I was listening to some, the ones you've been on and I'm just like getting an understanding for how you think or, or who you are. And I think you've been super, super vulnerable and I can feel even more of a connection. Like I'm like flip, when am I going to another race? Like I want to share a beer with you or like, come over and be like and like how did it go did did what you said you want to work on is it working like yeah it's super (laughs) awesome and and i thank you for that because i know the listeners are going to get so much from this one like i am you know doing the prep it's like i I look at the results and stuff but i want to see where this conversation goes i didn't kind of know it would go this deep um because i think there's so (laughs) much but there's so much value there you know because racing People don't understand it. Like you're not complaining about the pressure. It just is part of the sport. You're not complaining how hard this thing is. Like you have a great job. It doesn't mean it's easy. And I don't think people talk enough about the pressures. And and we're seeing it now, the mental state and some really famous tennis players taking time off their mental state. They couldn't handle it. And, And that's okay. How many people have breakdowns, you know, running these huge corporations? They're allowed to do it. But a, but a sportsman's not allowed to say, I'm not handling this because you're meant to be the most strong person in the world and you can't show weakness. It's like, I think we need to change that. Yeah, for sure. Or, or it's just like sharing more of like, I mean, nobody wants to be vulnerable. But you, And even like as athletes, like sometimes you just need a change. Like you just, it, it, it's not even like, is it good? Is it bad? I just need a change. You look at like Ken Roxon moved to, to – He's in, I think, court by Lake Powell now. Needed a change. Cooper Webb took a year off racing, came back on a different program at the front of the pack. Villapoto says, maybe if I would have changed teams, I would have pro- or lo- lengthened my career. And I think, like, you know, I've changed so much with my, over the years with my racing. Like, I need consistency because I'm sick of change. <laughs> but- <laughs> yeah. It's like, ah, new bike every year. Okay. Now I like instead of coming into the season working on my fitness, my strength, the bike set up, um uh, the bike is great. I just need to work on myself. It's like every year. New bike, testing, set up. Ah oh, this didn't work. We were too soft. Fire drill. Go to Europe. Live in Morzine. Get stiff make the bike stiffer. Make this part work. We're having issues with this part. We need to change it. Get a prototype. Do the, do this. Change a link. Uh, you know, this isn't working. That's not working. Uh, fire drill all the time. Fire drill, fire drill, fire drill. It's always like panic, panic, panic. Try to make it happen. Get back to the front. Like you're, you're a top, you're a top dude. How do I get back there? You know, like uh, put this bike on the podium. Oh, new bike next year. Put this bike on the podium. New bike next year. Put this bike on the podium. And it's like, dude, 
That's I'm draining. Tired. That sounds pretty I'm draining. I'm tired. You know? I'm tired I'm listening tired. to that. <laughs> I'm tired. But um, but so like going into the next, I, I'm really excited. We got this year. We're setting up the bike, and then you know going to like I have some time on this contract, um, two years to kind of, but if going through this process and always putting yourself in this repetitive, uh, place in your head where it's like, Oh, here we are again. Um, I, it's, it's taught me to just enjoy where, like find a way to enjoy where you are, which like even something like when you, sometimes when you go through these like really difficult things and you, you, it's, it's not that the the situation is actually difficult because when you say it like that, well, the way I just said it to you, it does sound tiring, right? But it's just a chapter in the book. Like as I get, like you can play it back to yourself and be like, this is where I am and, and, and make this situation. And I could just make my new chapter that same thing. Ah, oh, new bike, fire drill. We're going to go to the race. We're going to be a little off. Or I could just, it's all good. Like new bike, exciting, new people around me. They're hungry. You know, we're going to get the bike set up. I got two years on this, on this contract. We'll get through the first few races, you know, try to be in the mix, fight for wins at the end of the season. Good, good opportunity to try to get some consistency, you know, new bike. Don't exactly have to push the limits right away and push for wins at the start of the season, develop the bike throughout the season. If you change the if you change the context in what you're doing it's a lot easier to find a way to enjoy the process and if it doesn't go your way it's all how you it's all you deal with it and that's like like for sure something i've been working on but um i'm very excited to be back to be on this program like we went down like i said we went down south last week and being in like a group of exciting exciting new people and new new opportunities and everybody's passionate and you know the team manager he wants to prove that he's building a program the brand wants to prove that they're building a successful program we have good good pro, good parts on the team you know all the parts on the bike are really good we got an awesome engineer so man i'm excited yeah, man, it sounds sounds awesome. And uh, like you said, it's, it's quite exhausting, but I feel like you've mentioned a few times like everything you've gone through has made who you are now. Yes, you're on a new bike, sure. new program, but you're going to take all the experience of developing all those other bikes, which probably needed a lot more work um, and probably held your racing back a bit and you still survived that. And now, like you say, you can maybe be more patient now. Be like, yeah, the bike's proven, but it's new to me, so I'm going to take my time. And maybe yeah. a younger guy wouldn't. So it's it's pretty awesome that you can just lean on that experience, even with a program that's sort of. I mean, the bike's proven. <laughs> they went one, two, yeah, three there's... at a world champs before, so I'm pretty sure the bike's proven. <laughs> yeah, the bike's pretty good. Um, you know, and and I think the whole industry gets like so excited about this new suspension design, the idle or the you know, high pivot or this or that, and it. You, you you constantly have to make changes and develop a bike or else it especially like bikes like i feel like in mountain biking the changes are so extreme you know sell bikes year after year you sell bikes year after year um yeah we're making bikes better yeah they might ride better but sometimes you go crazy over here and then you come back over here and then you know you find you find a way in the middle and you know, you, you look at the program, like I said, they went one, two, three of Alp Soul. Gnar, debate, my favorite track, debatably the gnarliest um, race on the, on the circuit. And I mean, that was some time ago and they've had some changes and some developments. But for the most part, I'm really excited because the bike is pretty simple. Like it's not extreme in any way. Uh, so it makes it a little easier to lean on my knowledge and say, you know, we did this on this bike. This worked pretty good. We did this on this bike. It worked pretty good. You know, like I'm kind of feeling this, we can change this. And, and as I like get older or get and get more, I guess maybe not older, but more experienced in my career, I guess it really has nothing to do with age, but I've set up all these bikes and, and I found a way to be, to be towards the front on a variety of different, what's called packages. So what I'm looking for going forward, it makes it, I can, I can, 
I've had to learn a lot of knowledge, I think, very quickly. Like if you rode the same bike for five years, you wouldn't really learn that much because you'd always be on the same the same package where you have to get used to a new suspension or maybe the team, team changes tires, but you're changing one thing at a time. When I've had to change all these different factors multiple times, it's been, it's, it's caused me to have to grow. It's caused me to have to learn. And now I'm getting, getting to a place where I can pretty quickly pick apart things and be like, Oh, we need to do this. We need to do this. Ah, it's soft. I'm probably going to be 20% stiffer at the world cups. As long as I can get the balance at home, get, you know, the damping, right. I I know I like this preference or I have this preference so we can kind of skip a little bit and set it like I'm on Fox suspension this year. Again, kind of know where I want to be with that and how I want the buy let's call it the bias um to be in terms of like rebound like I like the low speed to be pretty quick and the high speed to be pretty slow and and then I can kind of quickly get to where I need to go and it makes it easier to do the testing when I have the experience because I feel like I've gotten a lot of years of experience very quick and now you know when you're in that situation it's not super fun but I've been through it and I've learned a lot and now I'm not, I'm, it's made me a better person now and it's going to be easier to, you know, get the bike dialed in for the races. Yeah. You've definitely been thrown in the deep end there with developing bikes, like, especially if you don't have the experience, like Greg, yeah. I can trust to develop a bike. He's, he likes doing it. He's done it for so long. I definitely didn't know my ass from my elbow. Like when I first started out, um, I, you know, so yeah, props to you, but we glossed over a, a, a subject. I think you wanted to unpack a bit from motocross or we got, I love comparing the motocross downhill sort of thing, but the, the former riders that become coaches and mentors, we've got a lot of coaches and they're incredible. Like I, I know they're studying the sport a lot. We've got some such knowledgeable guys. Um, do you think mountain biking maybe hasn't taken advantage of as much mentorship? Now there's a few more riders. Like I worked with Oscar Seitz on Giant, and I've still mm-hmm. stayed in touch, and he was incredible. Like I really enjoyed, had a mutual respect for him because I knew where he came from, but he really dug into the mental side, and he would had an experience of testing or other things. So I could bounce things off him, and he'd be like, dude, you're full of shit worrying about that, or yes, let's go down this rabbit hole. Um and I feel like we're not taking as much advantage of that as we can in downhill. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I I think that even I think that downhill is now getting kind of to the point, but maybe in the past, like ten years ago, maybe not as much. Which you you said you found somebody just because the sport has continued to evolve so fast. Like I don't think my, where I'm at with racing today, maybe I could relate as much to like like John Tomac. Like, I think that the sport was a bit different there. Like, yeah, yes. racing, mentally, fitness, training. Yes, all these things are, are applicable. But, like, I was talking to Mauricio Estrada last week, and I'm like, man, I would like to just sit down and talk about the things you learned in your career. And he's like, dude, you're, you're doing great. Why, what do you, why do you feel that? Well, I think there's always something to learn. And as well as, like, I've been trying to communicate with other high-level athletes, other sports, like um, – just try to you know see what 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 how their careers went what they've learned because I feel like I I share a lot on the podcast but you you only get so much on a podcast and it usually is pretty filtered so if you like have some sort of a relationship with a high level athlete and you can just call them on the phone like hey man how'd this go would this do how would you deal with this you know or or I think that that's very helpful to even have somebody in another sport or somebody that has been successful in downhill racing. Um, but personally, I, I like it's maybe if you have a friend that races, but it's not like I can call, you know, whoever like Loris, Hey dude, you know, like that's never going to happen. Like dude, you're competing against maybe if there's like a, like Loic and Loris, or maybe like, you know, when like I'm racing for and with Aaron, you know, that makes it a bit easier, which Aaron, I think, is very – his belief in himself allows him to share a lot, where I think it, it's it's interesting now, and I think we're just now starting to see that. Like, I think the French Federation works a bit with uh, Nico Vuyo, and then, like, obviously, Canyon has access to Fabian Burrell. Like, he's 
I believe the team owner there. So I, he, he, I believe runs Canyon collective, not a hundred percent sure, but I think that's how that works. So I would assume that, you know, Troy has access to Fabian, which I think he's pretty intense with racing too, because I think he's actually still and still riding and still testing and still really fast. So, um, yeah, trying to find those connections. You know, I use a lot of, like I said, I use a lot of, um, athletes and try to talk to a lot of athletes from other sports just to broaden the perspective. But I think it would be really good to have someone, if I personally had like a, someone that could come to the races with me and, and help like maybe, um, Nick's does, um, he's likes fitness trainer, but I think from the mental side and having someone on the track, it would be great to be in that position to be able to have someone you can trust all with you all the time. Yeah, I mean, other sports are building these teams. Like golfers have this, this individual sport, huge team. You've got the swing coach, putting coach, mental coach, physio, tennis as well. Like it's huge. There's more money in the sport. You can afford to do it. Mm. We're now relying on the teams. And if you're smart, you invest in yourself. You're paying a trainer. So, you know, if you can find a trainer that can help on the mental side or or something like that, I think it's definitely worthwhile. But so what sports are you connecting with? I mean, you don't have to give names of who you're chatting to or trying to connect with, but I would assume some no, motocrosses I mean, or yeah, who you're yeah, connecting for sure. with. Um, I'm, I've been talking. I want to jump on the phone with Cody Webb. He's a hardened girl guy. Like I reached out to him a couple weeks ago, um, and I'm looking to jump on with him. I actually, I talked to Brett Reeder a little bit ago, and he's – he had some really insightful approaches to like his happiness and, and riding. Cause I listened to a couple of his podcasts and it seemed like he was pretty unhappy with what he was doing in the competition. And, and just got to chat with him about maybe finding when I was at the Adidas athlete summit, he um, was, it really sparked a lot of interest in listening to him talk about how his mental state during competition um and how maybe unhappy he was and how he's a lot happier now and so it's cool to kind of get to talk to him about that and yeah i'm gonna try to jump on with some of the moto dudes um if i can a little bit um and yeah just just chatting just trying to chat all i can and uh you know it take an hour out of your day if someone's not like at the peak of performance at that exact time and they have time to just kind of learn and and try to try to grow a little bit yeah you've got a super big uh, growth mindset which you which you need in sport i think it's awesome and for life um <laughs> but i mean yeah. you'll be surprised like mentoring someone the guy that mentors gets a lot out of it people think oh i gotta ask for some time and i'm getting all this stuff and i feel bad about asking but if you are like a sponge and you take it on board give them a feedback hey i tried that thing it really worked like you get a lot of fulfillment from helping others. And, and I think, as you said, Gwyn's realizing that, you know, I think he, Gwyn's very misunderstood, you know, like those, those years when he was winning so many titles and, and quite introverted. And I didn't connect with him at all. And I was on the race circuit and like, maybe he's, I he's made quiet. up a story in my head about him, but it wasn't true. And I never said it as fact. I just like, I don't really understand the guy now the more he's helping you and I can see him at the race is like I'm getting more of an understanding of him. And, and, and I always had a hell of a lot of respect and I even more now because I thought he was going to be in and out of the sport like this, but now I can kind of, I'm gathering he's like getting more fulfillment with this knowledge he's got and he is willing to pass it on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The dude's quiet. He doesn't talk a lot, but he's, he's, like when you know when you're in his circle you're very in his circle but his circle is like he has he would rather have a few really close friends than have a bunch of acquaintances and a bunch of small talk he just kind of goes through says hello to everybody is super polite doesn't really but on the same time doesn't really open up or talk a lot to to very many different people um i want to jump back on with with mick Hanna a little bit more because i i've really enjoyed um, being friends with him um, and he's yeah. know, went over and raced enduro and he's pretty I think he's pretty busy at the moment but um, like when he was racing downhill we spent a ton of time together and he definitely mentored me quite a lot and like helped me greatly with my career and and I've really I, I really like Mick I think he's got a, an interesting you know interesting way about it and he was probably the first rider that helped you know give me some mentorship we rode 
together a lot. And um, yeah, it was, I'd like to talk to him more. I, I'd also like to talk to Sam Hill. I wish that I could jump I, on the phone uh, I was meant Sam. to ask. He's I was so meant quiet. to ask you because you've commented that like in a, there was a, I don't know if it was a bio and you said like, which mountain biker do you respect? And you said Sam Hill. And I wanted to know why, Dude. what, what about him? He's a savage. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I I'm asking you. That's what he, just, I, he is a savage. <laughs> Dude, I spend a lot. He just shows up. Yeah. And smokes dudes. Like doesn't say much. He's co- He's quiet, but confident. And he, I don't know. I just, I'm, I know that I'm not quiet like that. Like I'm, I'm, kind of in I'm, I'm very external i talk a lot i'm pretty loud but at the same time like i can be introverted i'm an introverted extrovert <laughs> like i talk a lot and i'm but i i also at the same time like stay pretty close to myself when it comes to like what my 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 beliefs are my thoughts and and some of that stuff like i'm quick to make small talk and I, I quickly will try to be friends with somebody, but at the same time, like if I don't get that back, I kind of internalize a bit. But I think Sam is like, I don't know. They just, he hasn't done a lot of podcasts. Like he did the gypsy tales one and didn't really say much. And, and I always try to say hello to him when he's at the races and, and, and be nice to the dude. Um, but he definitely doesn't want to talk. So I just think he's, Dude, he raced a ton. He won a lot of stuff. And I think mentally, like, I wish that I knew more about his mental approach or his thoughts towards racing just because I think the way he went about it was rad. Yeah. For sure. He, uh, he owes me a podcast. So any listeners, just go and s- slide into his DMs. He said, he, he said he'd come on <laughs> because, dude, I, I grew up technically getting mentored by him rennie graves Bryn. like i got to know the aussies i mean this was before your time the shit we got up to but the sheer talent and mental strength um i witnessed it firsthand it was it's it was crazy the self-belief he had in himself and the lines he would ride and and all that um yeah, it really is. How can you not respect him? What he did in the sport. I mean, he, you know, there's a few riders that have changed the sport, and and him yeah. being one of them for sure. Like, I think, like, accomplish, like all of his accomplishments are cool, and he's so much known for his accomplishments. But just like the mental, his mental side, and like the he was willing to do things that no one else was willing to do, and I that I think the lines he rode and the how sick he was on the bike a lot of that came from the mental side and i just and he just does not share any of that which i i think is is really really interesting um and i'd like to know more about it like the whole the whole like his mental approach to racing but he definitely does not does not do anything to share it um but i i see him i see him at the race i'll be hey man how's the kids doing how's the moto you know, try to ask him about things that are like, you know, away from the, that aren't because I'm sure the dude just gets pestered about downhill all the time. But it's like kids super into racing moto and hey, man, how's it going? You know, you'll sometimes say something, but not too often. He's, dude, he's the same with these. The, I, yeah, I know what you mean. I know like you know, chat to someone about what they're really interested in, you know, and for you like yeah. away from bikes is moto and. Dude, I like I said, we hung out, traveled across America together, and I'll get the same sometimes. I'm like, yo, Sam. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm like, are you honestly not going to talk to me? We go back 20 <laughs> years, dude. And he's, yeah. because he's just, it's not a, it's not personal. Like, it's not an insult. It's not because he's too cool. It's nothing. He's just no. so, so yeah. quietly guarded. But when he says something, it's either very important or like you can get something out of it or super funny, like his humor and wit is actually ridiculous yeah. as well like the shit he would say about some of the runs so um yeah we got to get him on we've got to get him on so like the way you want to pick his brain like i want to pick sean palmer's brain well i just like ah, this yeah. guy i mean that guy man like if you talk about headstrong will to win if you attitude like die trying that guy was like yeah, to he- me the founder of that yeah I mean, I've gotten, I got to talk to Palmer pretty early on a bit 
when I was like an absolute loose cannon um, on the World Cup circuit. And he'd just be like, when he was doing the Palmer project and I was uh, spending a lot of time with Shane Leslie and he would literally just stand up after we'd stood on the side of the track. He'd just like say to us, what the fuck are you two doing? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, imagine Sean Palmer saying that. That's a lot coming like, from oh, him. Yeah. <laughs> it was, we're getting mowed over in practice, having no idea what we're doing. So now that I'm at the position I am, he, he just called me Kubota because I was too loud. He said I was just too loud all the time. <laughs> but now that I'm in a different, a little bit of a different, probably still just as loud, but a little different position in my career in racing, I wish I could jump on and t- on chat with him. Because, I mean, he did, dude, from border cross, downhill. Like, we know him from downhill, but he said the hardest thing, he his, his biggest career achievement was his 250 main event. Like yeah, we made, made like, the main event. Yeah, he said that was the thing he's done that he's the most. I, I I'm don't, I'm not necessarily maybe I'm inaccurate, but um, he said that was the hardest thing to achieve or the mean, most meaningful. Maybe one of the. Did two he do outdoor? Which which one did he do? That I know he did outdoors, Supercross. not a supercross. Oh, so he made I a think supercross. He made a supercross main event. Yeah. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, to that. but I but I'm I've lived my life believing that. <laughs> which yeah, is, I, let's maybe, hey, don't ruin a good story with the truth. <laughs> but I think that I, uh, that's the thing I probably like when I watch Billy Levinovich qualify for a main event at 40, I'm like, just, I just want to, uh, if I could just try to make like an outdoor national, like a, like a outdoor qualify for the show at an outdoor national, that would be like, I mean, I've done all this stuff in, in downhill, like next to winning a world cup, that would be like the second goal I would ever want to achieve. Like winning a world cup is definitely like the thing that I would love to achieve. And yeah, maybe it may never happen, but I'm going to try to do it. Like that's what all my energy of every day goes towards. But if I didn't have that, I would be fully trying to qualify for an outdoor national. Like that would be next level. Would you still try to do it in your lifetime? Maybe. Who I don't knows? know. I'm 31. I want to race downhill for a while longer, like full effort. But like, I think like right now I could probably, I don't know, maybe come close My my little buddy, Keegan Rowley, he, he, um, he's got his pro supercross card and, uh, he should qualify for a supercross 250 this year. I would think he was like pretty close to qualifying at Detroit. He's racing the, um, the East coast and the dude's legit. And, uh, he's a bit faster than me, but think maybe i could hang under the right circumstances he's gotten way better in the last two years but we were like pretty close a while ago and yeah he's he's got his pro card and yeah does the deal i don't know if i could actually qualify for the for the actually make the show but i can for sure get my pro card if i were to put the time and effort into it and then try to qualify would be cool but uh that's i mean life different different goals i get i can eat up some money quick trying to be a motocross guy Dude, I was speaking to my nephew today and we we're talking about rally and I did these like little rally cross carts and he's like, oh, that's so cool. And I was like, yes, there's this guy, Semenek, that now is supported by Subaru. And, and he, he's like, oh, did he do that from forever? I was like, no, he just did it as a hobby, spent a bunch of money and got good. And he's like, oh, that would be cool. And I was like, I don't have the money for that. Like, I don't know if I want to no. burn a hole in my retirement trying to do that in South Africa. Like, there's no... There's no carrot in South Africa. Like I ain't getting paid to, or even like expenses covered if I was to somehow be good, you know. But um, did you yeah, listen we've to a his hole podcast? Seminek, yeah. He talked about that. It was really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really cool. Was really I'm, cool. I'm glad he did that. Yeah. We'll get a yeah, chat going awesome. as well, but I'll I'll just wait for that one to cool off. But um, I think it's awesome these podcasts. Like that's why I started. I was like, obviously you do a few of them, so people know your story. But I'm like, I don't think the people's stories are getting out there. Like we do the commentary, but we need something else. Like you need to build up the heroes. You need to build the backstory. Like why is the guy performing? Yeah. Why is he not performing? You know? Well, it, and, and all it these creates things. an emotional connection. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And also I, I like, you have all these high level athletes and they're all passionate about something else. And I just want to know what people are passionate about. Like to me, for me right now, like I'm, 
kind of on like a self fulfillment jersey journey outside of racing. Like, and I think that if I'm happier away from the races. I'll be happier at the races and I'll perform better. And I think that there's a big connection between like, even from like my, my, my environment creating a better headspace for myself and like having a clear headspace. And I've just lived in chaos for so long that like, I'm trying to reorganize my entire life from the files on my computer to like deleting all my emails, keeping my text like, getting my number of texts that need to be answered in my phone down. Like, cause I, I feel like I just forget everything when I'm living in chaos and like from literally my bedroom outward every day, I just clean and organize. And I think that that's really important. Like I, Cole Seeley talked about a lot about how he thought being organized helped to like, he's like how, how into being organized he is. Um, but I've been working on that. And then I like, and like different people's hobbies. Like if I don't ride my dirt bike, I am miserable. Like I, it's really important to me. And, and like at like forever, I was like afraid to ride my dirt bike. Cause if I got hurt on my dirt bike or something freak happened and like, I always ride fresh bikes. I always ride, usually had rode a 450 in the past because the motors are like pretty bulletproof for the most part. Like I don't ride a 250 F cause they rev so hard. And I've been, I've been riding a two stroke lately, but I try to keep, all of my dirt bikes fresh so that nothing freak happens unless it was a freak accident. Always have, always have new bikes. And I, but I just ride, I just love riding and I'm not willing to stop riding my dirt bike for downhill. Like, I just feel like if I, I need my weekends and I need like time away from like work. Cause if I only ever ride downhill and then I ride downhill on the weekends, it just feels like I'm, I'd never leave work or I never have time away. So like, making time to ride my hardtail because it's like for so much of forcing my career has been like making up for lost time because I started so late. But now as I like am more, you know, at the front of the pack, it's like, I'm going to make a Saturday to go hang out with my buddies that aren't mountain bike people and ride dirt bikes. And I'm going to like make time to go to the skate park and pump around on my hardtail because it makes me happy. So like, I'm really into like hearing how people, you know, unpack their lives and what what makes them happy and what they're all about and like Aaron it's fitness you know he's like so into fitness and wellness and and eating well and and being in good shape and I you know I have another buddy that I go to the gym with that's like he is his he's like a movement specialized specialist the dude is like can do he's you know 40 years old and he can he does cartwheels and jumps around like a kid. Like he moves, like he's like a small kid. He can do like the full back bend arches and he's just so into movement. So it's like cool to like get, you know, this community of people that's, you know, everybody's into something different. And then you, if you can get rid of your ego to learn from, and learn from everyone around you. Yeah. And a happy rider is certainly a fast rider and uh, it's really good for your wellness to like, yeah, I reckon. I reckon you know it, but uh, I'll share some um, some books and audio books and stuff that I've gone through with self fulfillment and happiness codes and all that. Like people think it's woohoo, but you have to work on it. You have to re sort of remind yourself. And that's interesting. You say like you, so you're not probably inherently an organized person or a neat person, but you're saying I want to no. learn a bit of this skill. And then bring it over to my racing so that might quiet the mind. There's less things to make decisions. Like I would, you know, I think certain riders are not like that. Like Brendan and me were like polar opposites. Like it's hilarious. And I would help him with certain things and he would help me with certain things. And I think that's why we got on as like training partners because, you know, my weaknesses he would help with and, and vice versa. But I was like, dude, you got to make so many decisions at a race already. Like, you shouldn't be leaving them till race morning. Like, oh, where are my goggles? What goggles am I using? What gloves? It's like, dude, lay it out the night before. Like, there's your practice goggle. There's your race goggle. There's your glove. There you there. Then when you just get there the next day, all you have to think about is picking them up. You don't have to go find them and be flustered. And, and I think people are so used to living in the chaos. Like you said, maybe I was used to living in the chaos. But uh, a little bit of preparation goes a long way. I think I was used to living in chaos to the point where I created created chaos. I created these chaotic situations. And I think that like, so 
my girlfriend had a pretty big brain injury um, maybe a year and a half ago. And she had a really bad concussion. And like watching her, and I've, I've hit my head a lot too, and watching her go through like her full, it's been almost a year and a half now. And I think I finally have her back to being her. You know, like as my girlfriend, you know, she's I'm not really a glad person to hear that anymore. for you guys. Yeah. yeah, which is pretty wild. But watching her, the things she needed to be happy, healthy, have a good headspace and, and watching her go through like her whole treatment just made me also realize how important these things are and how much like. I, if everything around me is chaotic, I feel like I'm in chaos. So then definitely trying to have everything be a little more routine. Like I don't want to show up to the track and be like, dude, oh, I forgot my shoes. Like, you know how many times I've forgotten my clip shoes going to the track? And it's like, you have. And, I'm all, and I'm always like, yeah, for sure. And it makes me rage. If I drive but that's 10 like, minutes to win. I, that's 101. You just make sure you've got a helmet dude, and clip shoes because the rest you can ride without. You dude, don't, I was riding. Dude. I was riding last week, and I'm like, I'm having shoe ish. I'm like, dude, my what is wrong with my cleats? Like, and I turned my shoes upside down, and I had HT, not Shimano cleats, in my shoes. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm in, I switched my shoes. I grabbed an old set of shoes, and I'm like, what is happening to me? Who am I? You know, like silly little mistakes. But I was like, dude, this could have like, I could have really gotten hurt because of this. Like, this is silly, but like, I get so mad when I forget something that I'm like, and it makes me so upset that I'm trying to do a better job at having everything more dialed in so these things can't happen, you know? And and I just want everything to operate, run and operate smoothly. And some, some people are live, can just like dig through the gear bag and find stuff, but like trying to be more precise and close my loops like i'm really bad at putting things away like close the cupboard make the bed when you're done with it you know like completing the loop but like when not like today like after we get off the podcast i got home from racing last week i haven't unpacked the bag yet so the stuff goes in the laundry the bag gets repacked the gear the gear bag for the week gets packed like trying to be very like tactical about how i do things to try to um, make things run smoother. And I think that that creates better headspace. And then if I like have like these habits at home, hopefully I'll have better habits at the races. When I do get in a chaotic, um, I have like a process when I'm, when I go back to like a chaotic environment, like racing, hopefully I'll have a better process, like a process for, you know, going through these, these steps that I, the steps become more routine. And then I don't forget my clip shoes on race day and no one has to drive and go get them. <laughs> well, Josh, Josh Bryson did get to the top of a race with not his flat shoes. He just had his like sneakers, but they weren't his 510s with good rubber or something. So, hey, it happens to the best of them, I guess. But yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and I think and I think that's part of what the top guys have been doing for so long. They have a process. They have a routine, mm -hmm. and the routine gets them out of their head. It's like, I'm going up at this time. You know, you've got that. train. I'm getting on my trainer at this time. Yeah, it warms the body mm -hmm. up. It helps you physically, but I've done some pretty fast runs just cold at the, from the top of the hill. But I think it's the routine, you know, and I think that will help yeah. you probably get to your potential more often. Like you're just looking for consistency. If you have a consistent routine, you've got far more chance of being consistent. Yeah. It's not a guarantee. I'm Nothing's a guarantee. No, I'm the most nervous when I wake up in the morning and once I get on the trainer, I'm good. Once I get to the top 40 minutes to start my, or my, my warm up takes 37 minutes. As soon as I get on the trainer, I'm good. No headphones. I don't listen to music. Um, like we never played like since her head injury. We, we, we can't, I never listen to music working on my bike cause I'll, forget something we don't usually like no no distractions no noise i just like have found that like since i've hit my head a lot i don't do well in chaotic environments and like i definitely like for me to focus i have to have like complete silence for me to focus really well and yeah 
just learning your process, you know, like there's, there, it's, it's so essential, you know, <laughs> like to, to have that routine dialed in and, and, and find, I guess, peace, you know, in what you're, in what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty cool for this day and age. Cause like multitasking is it's bullshit. doesn't exist. Um, yeah. Yes. You can listen to music and do the dishes, but that's quite like a self-conscious easy thing. But if you have to focus on something, playing a podcast, yeah. You're not going to get all the value. Like we probably all do it. I do it. But yeah, that's called deep work. Like you have to block out distractions and do one task at a time and you'll actually do it quicker. Um, I do the same when I'm editing this. Like sometimes like don't put the phone on because then I look at WhatsApp or messages and then an editing thing that could take an hour takes me two hours and then I get pissed off. Yeah. Like, you just got to do the deep work and and – yeah. you know avoid distractions but maybe before i let, let you go you've yeah you've talked about like side you off for the team i can only gather that not developing a bike at a world cup is going to be a positive what was the semi <laughs> you think? yeah you would think <laughs> i'm just going to go out on a limb and guess that it's a positive <laughs> um but it is what it is it's in the past it's made you you made you grow as a race and a human what uh what did you like think of the semi-finals Speaking of like ah, racing, old, the, going for, the old dead horse. Old, I don't know. I have, the have old to ask semi-final you. Semi-final horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, maybe that horse could go ahead and ride out, but uh, no. <laughs> you don't um, mind if the horse leaves the station and doesn't come back? Yeah, the horse can go. Uh, okay, fair no, enough. No, the semi, the semi-final is what I do like is at the World Cups. I liked having a more condensed schedule on race day. Get up, ride practice, mm. get ready for the semifinal, get the semifinal done, run, run done, come down, clean the bike, you know, clean your gear up, get ready, go back up, quick warm up, do your race run. Loved it. What I didn't like is coming down from the semifinal and be like, oh, yeah, third, sweet. Oh, wait, we still got to go race. And then tomahawking myself. Or <laughs> that, yeah, that sounds oh, pretty oh, much semi semi-final uh, and then blowing off the track and then you're watching the final and you're like because I, I just think that with it is they they think of it like as the heat race in the supercross but it's not the heat race like it's like a it's there's a lot of points on the line and you're we've all worked on our process to building a world cup race run and this special magic and and now it's like a completely different thing where you have to like do a run, but not really your run, but close enough to your run, and then go go again, and then try not to go over the limit. So I think that I could develop my process for it, and it looks like I'm going to have to do more of that. And But I just think it is, if they're going to continue to make the tracks faster, times tighter, shorter tracks, um, we're gonna, something's going to have to give somewhere um mm. and maybe if it was a five minute track that was you know pretty gnarly and wider margins and and you had more room i, I don't know if that would help for some reason in my head i think if the tracks were longer and the gap you could what, gaps cruise bigger, the semi a little bit more you could cruise the semi a bit more but when we're talking two and a half minute tracks you know everyone's pretty on the limit it doesn't really apply i don't think yeah. so i saw i saw why they brought it in like i can see some of I the understand. reasons and like the reseed it was like a reseed so that the broadcast looks better so like i understood all that i guess it's tough to not look at it from a racist perspective um now it's gonna maybe be the day before mm -hmm. so that adds a different dynamic and a different process so yeah we'll soon i guess you guys will soon see yeah, I think if you're consistently fast, it should be fine. But you, it's like you don't want to cruise because of the points. So it's just mm -hmm. like another. It, it's it's going to be really odd again. I think we we definitely need to. I don't know. It's different. It's going to be a new thing. Uh, so we're going to get done we can, with qualifying. We can gloss over it. Minutes. Yeah, you've probably you have spoken at nauseum with it because I listened to the other podcast, but um. Dude, uh, maybe wrap it up and uh, tell me what you are excited about that you maybe haven't touched on leading leading into the season. 
Yeah. Um, just the amount of preparation I'm getting, I think is, I don't know if I've, I've talked too much about that, but you know, getting the bike on world cup tracks ahead of time. Um, I've never, I've always just went from Windrock, which you know, I know if I'm using half my travel at Windrock, I should be in a good place at the world cups, but <laughs> I'm serious, like honestly, like if I'm <laughs> for great. the most part limiting travel, um, I know if the bike feels great here, it's going to be too soft. I'm going to show up to whatever, whatever, you know, Leo gang and be three spring rates low. It feels like, um, and I, I guess Leo gang, I'm always too soft. I, every year I leave Leo gang saying I was too soft to begin with, but yeah, just, um, having the ability to go ride some world cup tracks, get the bike on various different tracks travel around um ride ride some fun tracks and and get set up mostly because you know what you ride the same place and you know even through like covid we rode a lot at home um i could ride at windrock and you just get to the point where you're like thinking about if you're gonna have tacos for lunch or (laughs) while you're riding down the track you know you're you just get on autopilot and that's that's um really really difficult so to to just continue to do runs on the same track you've done a million runs on so like for like the workflow windrock is great and i really enjoy it but you know going go i think we're going to do a, a test camp here soon and go back overseas and we already did one and rode uh loik's pier track which was awesome so just really excited about riding new places and um yeah just enjoying riding my downhill bike more uh not necessarily always taking time to not always feel like it's at, you know, it's eight runs on the timing system, throw it in the truck, go home. And, you know, just trying to enjoy what I'm doing. We, we did some, we took the day uh, Sunday. Yes. Two days ago. No, Monday, Sunday. What day is it? Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday. Sorry. I think travel. I'm also, yesterday I'm also a travel day. Yeah. Losing track of days. Sunday, I went and rode rode some fun tracks with my girlfriend after the race, and and just enjoying riding downhill more than anything, and riding new places is the thing I'm most excited about. I feel like I'm I'm liking riding more than I have. Uh, last year, I spent the the whole middle of the season in Morzine and rode with Ali Davis quite a lot, and we were just laughing all the time and having a blast, and yeah, just trying to kind of enjoy enjoy what I'm doing. I guess I kind of talked about that, but yeah traveling around riding new places riding the downhill bike and enjoying it unreal man well dude i'm I'm glad your girlfriend's doing better and you uh, i'm really it. excited for the really really excited for the year for you and uh dude thanks so much for opening up being vulnerable talking about maybe a few different topics than than some of your race results and and uh yeah dude i really really appreciate it it's been f- yeah. super fun for me so i hope the listeners have enjoyed it as well yeah, I'm sure there's something in there, you know, a little, a little, a little something different. So uh, hopefully we can do another one. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty open to talking about some different some different uh, topics than how'd you get here and and what'd you do while you were there. <laughs> so awesome. Well, I definitely uh, that was an invitation. I think to do a round two. I I think we could go for hours. Uh, me and you are definitely not scared of talking, but. For listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, if you like rather watching visually, we're on YouTube. Search Moving the Needle Podcast. I think the biggest thank you is just hit that follow or subscribe. And I think especially this one, share it with a friend that you think can benefit from it. And uh, follow Dak's uh, race season. I think it's going to be exciting. Thanks, mate. Talk soon. <laughs>